before we open up the word today, um, we're going to take some time and, and, and pray. Um, I'm sure there are things on your hearts and minds that are significant that you'd like to pray about, and we want to give an opportunity to do that together as a congregation. In the pew in front of you, there's a prayer card. If you've got a prayer request that you would like for us to be praying for you about, please make sure to fill that out, drop it in the offering plate when it comes by later on in the service. But this week, uh, our hearts are heavy. Um, many of you remember Tunde and Grace Emanuel, and Grace has been struggling with cancer for a couple of years now, and she just went home to be with the Lord. And so we want to invite you to pray w along with us for Tunde and their three little girls, um, Tulu, Tomi, and Toby, and um, for their family, uh, if you would pray along with us for them. Uh, but we also have something happening today in our, um, in our midst. We, uh, for 33 years, Terry and Trudy Thompson have been providing furniture and home furnishings for international students. Um, who are able to come to, this, to, to the country but can't bring all their home goods. And so they had a few things that they would like to ask us to pray for them about. And what I'm going to do is in just a moment as we pray, I'm just going to lead through and pray for these things and ask you to join with me. So I want to just take a moment or two of silence and give you a chance to pray, and then I'll, I'll lead us in prayer to close this time. Whatever's on your heart, if it's a praise, you're excited about something God is doing, if it's a, a sadness, if there's a, a loss maybe, or there's a concern or a need that you have, now would be a good time to take this before the Lord. So let's pray together. hearts are heavy. Um, death was not anything that you wanted for us, but in our rebellion as, as your created beings, death entered into this world, and the separation that we experience is just a reminder that you have better things in mind for us. Thank you that Grace Emmanuel was your daughter, that she had put her faith and trust in Jesus as her Lord and Savior, and she's with you now. But Father, Tunde and his precious little girls are here, and we pray for your comfort and your, your strength for them during this time. We look forward to being reunited with our loved ones who it feels like are just a bazillion miles away from us, but they're safe in your arms waiting for us to come and be with them. And for them, it will be just a moment. Thank you, Father, that you are so good to have sent Jesus to die in our place so that we could come to know you and come into relationship with you. Thank you for the opportunity that you give this church through the ministry of Terry and Trudy Thompson and the way they have reached out and ministered to international students from around the globe for 33 years. Father, we pray that, that even though the schedule got messed up a little bit um, and some of the students won't coming, be coming right after orientation, that you'll still bring a, a large crowd this Friday um, as they come to receive the, the home goods and the furnishings. Pray for the team of people who will be un, un, unloading the, the truck today and loading it all up and organizing it throughout the week. We pray that you would just... Fill them with joy, knowing the students that they'll be ministering to. And pray that the students, as each of these workers handle these different chairs and beds and, and desks and, and sheets and all the different things that will be available to them, that they would, they would pray and they would seek you for the as students who would have those uh, items. And that those students would feel your unconditional love and know that you want to know them personally. Pray for lasting bond to be developed 
between people in this church, the Thompsons and their team, and the students who are coming from around the globe. Lord, we know that they are the cream of the crop. They're the best of the best. And we pray that you would give us an opportunity to love on them for your glory and your, your goodness. Pray for a smooth and clean cleanup and set up and safety for everyone who delivers furniture and um, the opportunity that we have to be part of this. We love you and we honor you in all that we do. We don't want any of the credit. We don't want any of the glory. We want to just let you be magnified and make your name famous. Thank you so much for bringing us here today for the time we've had to worship you and as we continue in worship open up our hearts and minds let us hear what you would say to us today and speak to us through your word in Jesus name amen <clears throat> friction friction is the force excuse me the force that resists the motion of one surface against another we can experience friction when we take a piece of sandpaper and we rub it up against, uh, well, your fingers, or a, a piece of rough wood. Or you experience friction when you take a knife that's the blade has gotten dull and you want to get some of the, the nicks out of it and you put it up against a metal sharpening tool or maybe a whetstone. We all experience friction in some way or another. Friction is present at least potential when we interact with our boss, when we interact with our coworkers, when we interact with our teachers or our fellow students, it can even be present when we interact with our spouses. Friction can be present when it's time for our kids or if we're raising grandkids, our grandkids to go to bed and when it's time for them to get up in the morning. Sunday morning can be a day that produces lots of friction. Simply put, friction happens. Can I get an oh yeah if you understand what I'm talking about? No. Ephesians chapter 5 and chapter 6 have been a couple chapters that have done a lot to produce friction for people. I mean, phrases like, wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives and give yourself up for them. Children, obey your parents. Servants, obey your masters. We would say, employees, do what your employer says that you should do. What if we could reduce the friction in our relationships? What if instead of, of, of creating heat, we create light? What if instead of it being a problem that we interact with one another, we could figure out a way to move forward together? And those things that would normally bring friction can actually be smoothed out so that as people, we can work together to accomplish all that God wants us to accomplish. A team of engineers at the U.S. Department of Energy Ames Laboratory created a compound that they call BAM. BAM is composed of boron, aluminum, and magnesium. BAM is purported to be the slipperiest substance in the world today. I, I wanted to learn a little bit about this thing, so I looked up an, a website. This one's called, uh, this website is interestingengineer.com. This is what it says about BAM. BAM has the potential to solve every engineer's worst nightmare, frictional wear. Friction degrades machines, expends massive amounts of energy, and adds a, a large degree of complexity to design. Submission is one of the most misunderstood concepts in the world. It is one of the greatest friction producing concepts that any of us 
have ever had to encounter. But a couple of weeks ago, when Tim Hall preached for us out of Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 33, he pointed out that it's not, it's not submission that's the problem. It's actually the misunderstanding of submission. It's the misapplication of submission. It's the abuse of submission. It's the caricature of submission. That's where we run into problems. Because abusing authority creates friction in our relationships. Abusing authority creates friction in our relationships. And that friction keeps us from moving forward together. God has an important role for First Baptist Church of Golden to play in His plan to transform the world. We're drawing our study in the book of Ephesians together to a close today. Ephesians is all about the part that I can play, the part that you can play, the part that we as a congregation can play in God's plan to transform this world. And as we, as we look into Ephesians, Paul has been telling us, look, there are some things that I want to do in this world, that God wants to do in this world, and he wants to use you to do it. So our role, we believe, God has called First Baptist Church of Golden to be a force for God's grace in Golden and beyond by being disciples of Jesus. And we believe that when we do that, God is going to change us. He's going to change our community. He's going to change the state. He's going to change the country. He's going to change the world. Because God is about transforming the world. And this is the role that we get to play. Be a force for God's grace in Golden and beyond by being disciples of Jesus. But relational friction wears on us. Have you ever come across somebody in church that you just didn't like? No? Okay. I'm going to pray. We're going to go home. Yeah, we get on each other's nerves. Hang out with me for a while and I'm going to get on your nerves. You'll probably get on mine too. Relational friction is going to keep us from moving forward together. But God brings us into each other's lives because he knows that there's a rough edge that needs to be sharpened off of me. And you're the one to help with that. And I'm the one to help with it in your life. And so God, after Jesus ascended back to heaven, sent down his BAM, the Holy Spirit. And when we allow the Holy Spirit to do what he is called to do in our lives, he puts a layer that helps get rid of the friction in between us. The Holy Spirit and our submission to him is the key to reducing relational friction in our relationships and in our church. Ephesians 5.18, passage we looked at a couple weeks ago, it says, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. It's excessive. It's, it's over the top. It, it just will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. To be filled with the Spirit, we said then, was to be controlled by the Spirit. To, be, to yield ourselves to the Spirit. To surrender ourselves to Him so that He calls the shots in our lives. So the evidence that the Spirit is controlling us shows up in several different key ways. A couple weeks ago, we saw that one of the ways that the Spirit, the evidence of the Spirit, smoothing things out, taking care of relational friction is happening, is in how we worship together. He said, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, and giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, is if that's how we're supposed to be relating to each other when it comes to our worship, our mu the music portion of our worship, are we allowing the Holy Spirit to reduce friction? Or are we at odds in our hearts 
maybe even verbally, with, say, the style of music that we're choosing. I think sometimes we get caught up in, and we think that worship needs to look like this. And you know what worship is? Worship is me saying to God, you are worthy of everything I have. That's what worship is. Worship isn't a style of music. Worship isn't a, a version of the Bible. Worship is me saying, God, you are worthy. And as you bring me together with your people, we are going to worship you together. I think sometimes we allow the enemy of our souls to plant thoughts in our minds that if worship doesn't look like this, then we didn't worship God and I am not happy and I'm going to go somewhere else or I'm going to cause a problem with that we need to realize when the Holy Spirit is working that sort of friction should go away it should be reduced because we're allowing him to work in us the Spirit's presence is also obvious in how we relate to one another now the, the principle is stated in verse 21 of chapter 5 we're told submit to one another out of reverence for Christ now that's before he talks about husbands and wives. It's before he talks about children. It's before he talks about slaves and masters. He's saying, everybody, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. We show that we're listening to the Spirit and that we're allowing Him to reduce the friction when we submit ourselves to one another out of reverence for Christ. The church is God's chosen method of world transformation, but the church is not simply called to do something. You and I are not simply called to do something. The church is called to create something that this world cannot create. We are called to create something that this world cannot create, a place of refuge in this dark and chaotic world. People won't find that anywhere else. The sad commentary on the church of today, though, is that we don't submit to the Holy Spirit. We have our agendas. We have our things we want to accomplish, and we fight each other. There's an old poem I've said this before but it came to mind again so you're stuck with it to dwell above with the saints we love oh that will be glory but to dwell below with the saints we know well that's another story God wants you and me to work together to accomplish his purposes we are all here for a reason. I believe that God is sovereign and, and we had a divine appointment today to meet together because he wants to say something to every single one of us. I like how Mark Galley, he's the uh, chief editor of um, Christianity Today. I like what he said here. He says, we're not here, he's talking about the church, to make the world a better place we're here to invite the world into a better place, the church. And really, the only way the church becomes that better place is if we are submitting ourselves to the Holy Spirit. And we're letting Him take that friction away, letting Him, or inviting Him to use that friction to sharpen me, to smooth me out, to make me a better person and to make you a better person. When we surrender to the Holy Spirit, He creates a community of grace unlike anything that this world can offer. Does that sound like a place you want to be part of? Can I hear an oh yeah? yeah, oh yeah. So, the Holy Spirit comes and he, and he, if you will, He puts a layer of Himself 
in between our relationships. And I, I want to look at three layers. Oh, this passage will, will tell us about three layers that will reduce friction in us. So the Holy Spirit will reduce relational fr fr friction in us when we, first of all, follow the Holy Spirit's example. First of all, follow the Holy Spirit's example. Jesus did not come with his own message. I mean, think about this. Jesus is God eternal who took on flesh. He walked among us. But he did not come with his own message. Listen to what Jesus said in John 14. The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. And then in verse 31 of the same chapter, he says, I do as the Father has commanded me. So Jesus submitted himself to the Father's plan. And he only spoke and only did the things that his, he saw and heard his Father do and speak. The Holy Spirit, he did not come with his own plan. He did not come with his own words. Listen to what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit in John 16. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. So, the point is this. Just as Jesus and the Holy Spirit submitted, we must submit. If we are going to demonstrate that we are followers of Jesus, we follow his example. We follow the example of the Holy Spirit and we submit ourselves. Just as Jesus and the Holy Spirit submitted. A second friction-reducing layer is applied by the Holy Spirit when we take submission personally. When we take submission personally. It's not something someone else is supposed to do. This is something that I need to be paying attention to. The overriding principle is clear. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, what's going to happen as we get into chapter 6, those nine verses are going to give us some other relationships where we'll be able to see if we are allowing the Spirit to reduce friction, if we're submitting ourselves and surrendering to Him. Now, submission, the word submit, implies an organizational hierarchy. There is the authority of, of one over another. The word literally means to line up under. But, and here's where we need to pay careful attention. The emphasis is not on the one in authority getting their way. The emphasis is not the one in authority getting to be the, the big man on campus or the, the big person in charge. That is abusing authority. Our submission, that passage says, is out of reverence for Christ. As a disciple of Jesus, the motivation for my submission is my love for Jesus, is my desire to honor Him, my desire to live for Him, my desire to follow after His example. It's not so that I can be the one in authority. Submission is modeled by the Holy Spirit. It's owned by me. And finally, I will make it personal when I and each of us practice submission. We've already looked at submission in the relationship of the, the husband and the wife. Now we'll look at the relationship between kids and parents and masters and slaves or employees and employers turn to Ephesians chapter 6 page 617 618 in the pew bible if you're going to follow along with one of those and as we get into this it, we see how, how submission kind of expands its emphasis it begins with husbands and wives like we already said but it moves into the relationship with uh, parents and their kids now I'm looking at some kids. We know most of our kids are down in kid zone right now. But 
the thing that we need to understand for, from a kid's perspective is, is parenting is the hardest job anyone would ever do. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Someone's catching on there. Yeah. It is one of the most difficult things that you will ever do because even though we have lots of people who say they know how to do this, they're really, every kid is unique. I remember as a young man in ministry, I would hang out with, with young couples and I, I would see how their kids misbehaved. And I, I, I came up with a seven-point sermon on how to make your kids behave. <clears throat> then I got married and started thinking more in depth about what it would be like to have a kid and then I came up with the same you know I, I redid that sermon seven suggestions on how to have a healthy family and then we had kids and I, I all I have was seven questions on how to how to do this and survive but parenting is is the most rewarding and yet most difficult job and kids think they have it worse because the passage says children obey your parents but check this out if you're a kid here today this is one of the very few passages where God makes a promise to you he makes this commitment to you he says if you'll obey your parents you'll have a long life this is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land this is a big deal to God so it should be a big deal to you as a kid. We learn how to relate to people in authority by how we relate to our parents. Now I understand sometimes our parents don't give a great example. There were plenty of times that I had to say to my, my five kids, I'm, I'm, I was wrong, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? And some of us had parents who were downright abusive. When we're called to obey any, any person in authority, we're never called to obey them when they tell us to do wrong, when it's going to harm us or them or someone else. But for the most part, we need to look to our parents and know that they love us. They care about us. They know a thing or two because they've seen a thing or two. God wants us to obey, wants kids to obey parents just like he wants them to obey him. Now this kind of, uh, a really strong point he makes here in just a few little words. It says, obey your parents in the Lord. Now, the phrase in the Lord qualifies the verb obey. It does not qualify the noun parents so he's saying in the Lord obey your parents he's kind of taking the obedience to parents and he's putting it up on the same level as, as our obedience to him he reserves that reverence for himself but he's saying kids I want you to see your parents as for me and I want you to obey parents the way we invest in our kids, and some of us are, as grandparents, are in that role again, raising grandkids. And the way we invest in our kids is a sign of how seriously we take our commitment to Jesus. Because our job is not to turn them into, you know, perfect people. Our job is to take them right where they are and let them know that we love them. And most importantly, that we love Jesus. The way we invest in our kids says, says to them and to anyone else around us looking how serious we take our commitment to Jesus. Fathers, we're told, do not provoke your children to anger. Now, even though this word is translated fathers here, it is translated in Hebrews eleven twenty three, 23, parents. It's not just focusing on dads here. Dads, we need to make sure we're taking the lead and being the, the, the father we need to be. Set the example and, and we're not babysitting our kids, we're investing in our kids. But this is a team effort. Parenting does not happen well without a mom and a dad. And, and it's tough as a single parent to make that happen. It's tough 
when you have two parents and, and one is absent because of work or whatever the reason is as well. God designed it that way so that we could help our kids come to know him and experience the way a man loves and the way a woman loves so that they can interact with that. Raising our kids is a team effort, but here's the thing, and here's where I think we lose it sometimes in church. The outcome that we're looking for isn't just to produce good kids or nice people, productive members of society, or even good churchgoers. What God wants us to produce That was my fault. <laughs> Love technology. What God wants us to produce are children who love him. Because it says, bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. So here's the thing. When our kids love Jesus with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength, everything else will fall into place. That's what's known as a keystone habit. If, if you focus on them loving Jesus... And we do that because they know that we love Jesus. They see it in our lives. They see it in how we interact with each other. They see it in how we interact with our spouse. They see it in how we work and how we treat our neighbors and how we talk when we're driving and how we drive when we're driving. They see all that and then they hear us tell them and they have us bring them to a place where they can know more about Jesus and, and learn to be more like him and grow in their faith with him. When our kids see that, everything else falls into place. Loving Jesus, introducing our kids to Jesus, helping them grow in their love for Jesus, that is a parent's number one priority. Now we move outside the circle of the family and Paul begins talking about slaves and masters. And in the first century, the the probably the best although there are more slaves now today than there have been in the past, you know, century. It's crazy. Um but in order for it to apply to us, the relationship I think that's closest is going to be employer and employee. And the the two questions we have to ask are how am I supposed to allow the Holy Spirit to reduce friction when I'm under authority? And how do I allow the Holy Spirit to reduce friction in my relationships when I am the authority? What do I do in those two situations? When we are in any subservient role, yielding to the Holy Spirit will reduce friction between myself and that person who's in authority when I do three things. When I recognize their God-given authority. The passage says, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling. And it's not a fear and trembling of them, although they can do some damage. It's a fear and trembling of God, honoring, honoring him for who he is. So since I put God in the position of authority of my life, what that means when I'm an employee is that I reflect my love for him in how I work in how I relate, in how I do what my boss tells me to do. And I offer that, here's the key, I offer my work back to God as an act of worship. That's what I do. So that's why the passage ends with, with a, severe, a sincere heart as you would Christ. We recognize their God-given authority. We also do our job as if we were doing it for Jesus. The passage continues, not by the way of eye service or as men, as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man. Every task we undertake, however mundane, should be done to the best of our ability, offering it back to Jesus as an act of worship. Imagine what it would be like to have an employee like that 
Well, be an employee like that if you're an employee. There's a third thing. Look for your reward from Jesus alone. Look for your reward from Jesus alone. Whether you get accolades, whether you get recognition, whether you have somebody undercut you at work, whether you do the work and somebody takes the credit, the passage says this, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or free. God sees, and he will reward. What do we do, though, if we are the one who is the authority? How are we supposed to handle that situation? Now, this is, this is kind of where Christianity gets a knock. Because some will look at the Bible and it will say, you know, the Bible really doesn't come out very strongly against slavery. Why is that? It's interesting, if you look at, at uh, the, the, the church and, and Christianity down through the centuries, you see that wherever religion goes, bondage follows very quickly. But wherever Jesus and the church go, and I'm making a distinction, because some, some who are calling themselves the church are really religion and really not following after Christ. But wherever Jesus and the church go is freedom. Always. Always. There's a really incredible book if you want to read something about this. It's called The Triumph of Christianity by a guy named Stark. Uh, incredible book. Um, and it, it's all, it's hi history. And helps you see things from a little bit of a different perspective. Because we need to understand that, that with Jesus is freedom. I like what... Um, one of my former profs at Dallas Seminary said in a commentary he wrote in Ephesians, he said, Christianity's emphasis has always been on the transformation of individuals who will in turn influence society, not the transformation of society which will in turn transform individuals. Should we as Christian citizens vote? Should we work for legislation? Yes, we should do all that. But you know what's going to change our country? You know, it's going to get rid of whatever kind of slavery we're struggling with, whether it's an addiction to porn or it's an addiction to gambling or it's an addiction to eating or whatever it is. You know what's going to change all that? Jesus changing me. Him transforming me. And what happens when he transforms me? Imagine, multiply it by all of us. We are transformed, being continually, continuing to be transformed and he will transform your neighborhood, your house. Your, your community that you work in because he's transforming us. Then Paul says a really scandalous, subversive thing in verse 9. He says this to those who are the authority. Masters, do the same to them, talking about the slaves, and stop your threatening knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. The master, the one who is in authority, is told to serve their slaves the same way they expect their slaves to serve them. Now, does that sound like Christianity is being silent on slavery? No, it just takes it from a different perspective. The one in authority is to recognize the slave's God-given value. And they are to exercise their authority as a service to that person. When I am in authority, the Holy Spirit reduces friction when I serve those under my authority as I want them to serve me. Now, if you want to be the, the master, if you want to be, your, your goal is to be the best in your field, your goal is to be the strongest, the toughest, whatever it is. As a follower of Jesus, this is how you do it. This is what Jesus said. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be your slave. The slipperiest, most friction-reducing compound known to mankind is BAM, created by the U.S. Department of Energy Ames Laboratory. The Holy Spirit, the third member of the Trinity, 
God from eternity past to eternity future, He, intentionally sent by God to reduce relational friction, every source of friction you would ever have in your life and me and mine, if we will simply yield to Him. And if we do that, He will enable us as a congregation to be a force for God's grace in this community and beyond because we're being disciples of Jesus. I think I would summarize what I think he's saying here in this passage with simply this. One simple challenge. Submit to the Holy Spirit and we will move forward as a force for God's grace. really kind of rubs us the wrong way, doesn't it? There will be times, probably at 11 o'clock today, by 11 o'clock today, there will be times when you will have somebody rub you the wrong way. Maybe I just did. On your way out the door, our wonderful ushers have a little piece of sandpaper that you can take if you want, put in your pocket. And I'd encourage you to put in your pocket so when you put your finger in, your hand in your pocket, you'll remember. Because there'll be someone that's going to rub you the wrong way. And when you remember that, ask right then, make this your habit. Holy Spirit, how do you want me to surrender to you in this right now? Let's pray. Jesus, I want to say, I don't get it sometimes. Life just doesn't make sense. Relationships are hard. Things are difficult. But I'm grateful that the Holy Spirit is, has been sent to reduce the friction in my relationships. I pray that you would help me this week to remember. To remember to surrender to him. I pray, God, that, that if there's anything that you've put, you've put your finger on today in our relationships that, that need to be surrendered to you, that we would have the courage to do that. And if there are any relationships that are broken because we didn't surrender, give us the courage to do whatever we need to do to make that happen by surrendering ourselves to your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.